Topic 11. Christianity's triumph transforms a stumbling empire. All right, Constantine, Constantine, you say tomato, I say tomato. I think I use both of them. It really doesn't matter. Constantine's protection of Christianity. Boy, this is a tough one. How can I ever know what is really in somebody's heart? Somebody might say something to me and they may totally appear sincere, but their actions will belie their words. Then I know they're lying. So was Constantine really a Christian in his heart, in his personal faith? Or did he realize that Christianity was a tide that couldn't be resisted? And so he decided, I'm just going to go with them. Was it one way at the beginning and another way at the end? You'll often hear that Constantine was baptized on his deathbed by a heretic, a guy by the name of, not a man by the name of Arius, but there was a, a theologian by the name of Arius, and his, his uh, followers were called Arians, and one of these Arians baptized Constantine on his deathbed. Arius, who believed that Jesus was Superman but not quite divine, I don't think it quite matters for this discussion here. It's an interesting question for theologians and where Arius fits in. And why is he baptized on his deathbed? Does that mean he's not a Christian when he favors Christianity? Well, you could favor Christianity without being a Christian because as emperor, he would have to give orders to spill blood, and he couldn't have done that if he was Christian. In this period of time, there's a strong pacifist uh, run in Christianity. And so all of these things are quite complicated. My own view is that, is that he was moving in the direction of believing in Christianity. I don't think he probably ever gave up his own paganism and that he did believe that it was a tide that couldn't be resisted. But I think he was favorably disposed toward Christianity as opposed to simply letting it ride. There's a big scene. You know, somebody needs to make a movie about this. The Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Constantine is involved in this tetrarchy, right, where there's an Augustus and a Caesar in the east and in the west, and he's involved in this civil war, and after this battle, he's the only one who's left standing. And the key moment takes place at a battle called the Milvian Bridge, and it takes place in the year 312 AD or CE, and our source here is Eusebius. Eusebius is a bishop who ends up being a biographer of Constantine, owed Constantine a lot, if you ever read Eusebius on Constantine, Constantine never even had a bad thought in his head, so we have to take care of that notion in the uh, sources as well. Keep an open mind that Eusebius was obviously praising his boss. But here's the story. Constantine has a dream while he's sleeping or has a vision while he's awake. There are different versions of the story before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, and he sees in the sky a bright light and he sees a symbol that looks like a cross. And this symbol is what's called a key row. C-H-I is the first letter. R-H-O is the second letter of the first two letters in the Greek word for Christ. A key row symbol looks like a P with an X through the bottom. Perhaps you've seen it. With the sun in the background. Now, when I say the sun there, I mean the sun, S-U-N. But the son of God, according to Christians, S-O-N, spelling counts here, is Jesus. So he hears a voice that says, In hoc signo vinces in another version, in hoc signo vinceres, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign, by this sign, vinces, conquer, or in hoc signo vinceres, by this sign, vinceres, you will conquer. And he orders his men to paint the key row what to our eyes looks like a P with an X at the bottom, on their shields. And he takes this symbol and he puts it on his own breastplate of his armor and on his helmet. And he fights this battle 
and he is victorious against these other co-emperors, and that's it. He wins. Now the question is, who gave him that victory? Was it the sun god, S-U-N, Helios, backlighting the image of the sun god, S-O-N, Jesus Christ, Kiro Christ? Which one was it? According to some stories, he has not only his men write the Kiro on his she their shields, but highly polish those shields and that when the enemy was coming, they pointed their shields so that the sun reflected back on it. Boy, this really complicates it. And let me make it even worse complication. Some people talk about Jesus as the light of the world. You can see how complex this is. Well, it's pretty clear that Constantine is hedging his bets. And this takes us back to our original question. Remember we asked, was he really Christian? Or did he see Christianity as a tide that couldn't be stemmed? Well, the interesting thing is that right in the aftermath of the Battle of Milvian Bridge, which is in 312, and 313, and 314, he has commemorative coins struck. We do this all the time. And in those first coins, there is a very, very large sun, S-U-N, and a very small key row. So it certainly looks like iconographically, using the images, that he is favoring Helios, the Greco-Roman sun god, the star in the sky. But later coins have a very small sun, S-U-N, and a very large Kiro superimposed on it. And we believe that that may indicate his own transformation from Greco-Roman pagan to Christian or moving toward Christianity and or the notion that his public statements saying that the Helios God gave him the victory wasn't playing very well with Christians and so he at least changed the propaganda. We're never going to know for sure, but here's something that we do know for sure. The very next year, 313, he gives out what's called the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan is misunderstood. Most people believe, incorrectly, that it made Christianity the one, the only faith of the Roman Empire. Incorrect. And significant for our story because it's another example of him hedging his bets. Christianity is favored by the Edict of Milan not only tolerated, but favored. However, other religions remain intact. He allows all faiths. And so that kind of brings us back to the religio licita of Judaism. You may pray to your God for the protection of the state and the emperor. He favors Christianity, not only giving it legal protection, but he also begins to endow the church with material, land and property. Now, for Martin Luther, boy, there's a jump 1,200 years ahead. This is the beginning of the end. Martin Luther says, it is when Christianity becomes a state religion and gets entangled in politics and money that it distances itself from the poor, pure, persecuted church. That the church of the Middle Ages did not reflect accurately a community of belief founded by a poor carpenter from Nazareth. And so the donation of Constantine has a later history. The piece of paper itself that was put forward as the donation of Constantine was discovered in the 1400s by a man named Lorenzo Valla, a Renaissance humanist, to be a forgery. Does that mean that Constantine did not endow the church? The main conventional wisdom, the mainstream view is no. We believe that 
If someone asked me to find my marriage certificate, I'm not quite sure I could dig it up. So I might go have one made. And the piece of paper that I have made, I can do all sorts of things on my computer, is a forgery. Does it mean I am not married? No. So it's pretty clear that Constantine gave money, land, property, and favor legal protection to the church, though the document itself was, in fact, a forgery. The document is fake. The act is clearly real. He gave the palace of his wife. Yes, I said that correctly. He gave his wife's palace, called the Lateran, to the local bishop of Rome. I always wanted to see that scene where he came home to dinner that night and said, hey, honey, give me the keys to your palace. I'm giving it to the guy down the street. That was probably an uncomfortable conversation. And the Bishop of Rome at this point is not the Pope. He doesn't walk around in a white robe. He's a local leader. He claims to be the heir of St. Peter, to have greater authority than the bishops of other communities. But many bishops and many other communities are saying, well, OK, you may have a certain more prestige, but you don't have a jurisdictional supremacy you may be first, but that doesn't mean you have a jurisdictional supremacy over to us, and that's part of a larger story in the history of Catholicism. In fact, that Lateran palace, which Constantine gives to the Bishop of Rome about 315, remains the papal church and residence until 1308. Nobody used the word Vatican. They would say, the Lateran. I'm going to the Lateran. And in fact, to this very day, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, and his seat, his chair, as Bishop of Rome, is not St. Peter's Basilica. It's St. John, what became St. John Lateran, series of churches built there. Elsewhere in the city, remember Rome has seven hills? Well, if you go to Rome today, one of the things you notice is that ancient Rome, the old forum, is separated from the Vatican by the Tiber. And some of you may have gone past the Castel Sant'Angelo, which is Hadrian's tomb. Yes, that Hadrian. You have to cross the river, a pontus. You have to cross a bridge to get there. And that's because we dumped bodies over there. If we're going to kill criminals and we're going to crucify them, we're certainly not going to do it by the city. And isn't it good to throw garbage across a river and so that's why St. Peter's Basilica is where it is, separated from the old city. Now, obviously, with urban sprawl, it's all part of you know, Rome itself, one city. And so while the Bishop of Rome lives in the Lateran Palace until 1308, Constantine builds a shrine to St. Peter, what will become a basilica, and there will be several basilicas until the Renaissance Basilica domed as we have it now, near the spot of his martyrdom. Priests and clergy get particular privileges and protection. And to create an economic zone where the Bishop of Rome doesn't have to keep coming to the emperor for money, he has income. Constantine probably gave a swath of land running southwest to northeast across the boot of Italy in central Italy that will over time be called the Papal States, which is in fact, in one way or another, in the hands of popes until 1870 and the unification of Italy. That's the story of Constantine. But he is only one of two big Christian emperors in the fourth century. I think it's safe enough to call him Christian. Theodosius, Theodosius surely could be called Christian. It is Theodosius the Great that does, who does, what many people think the Edict of Milan does, and that is make Christianity the one, the only, official religion in the Roman Empire. Now, the language is very interesting. So Theodosius called the Great because of this act, like Antoninus Pius was called pious because he allowed Christians to worship in the 160s. Theodosius the Great in the year 380 and 381 
declares Christianity is the official and only religion in the empire. No other religions may exist, and those who follow those other religions, notice the change, are atheists, outlaws, traitors, pagans. Isn't that interesting? So the language shifts entirely. Christians who were on the brink a gener two generations ago, anyone who is not a Christian, now they are atheists, outlaws, traitors, criminals, pagans. And an unfortunate chapter in the history of Christianity is the fact that very soon thereafter, those who had been persecuted, Christians, now become the persecutors of non-Christians, including Jews, their fellow monotheists. And there are other problems here. And these are some of the problems that Martin Luther and John Calvin and some of the other Protestant reformers will point to. Again, they look back at this period. I tell folks that if you're going to take one course in church history, you should take a course on the early church or the Reformation church. The reason is that the early church asks fundamental questions and the Reformation church re-asks those same questions viewed through the lens of this thousand year medieval period in between. So if I have an emperor who is Christian, who has lots of political power, who clearly has military power and physical force, and then I have a bishop of Rome who is now getting bigger because he has this protection, wealthier, who can evangelize more, who has the claim to be the successor to Peter among, over against other bishops, the question then becomes who's ultimately in charge? And this is a question that resounds throughout the Middle Ages. Who's ultimately in charge? Is it the civil ruler who takes the title defensor fidei, defender of the faith, defender of the church, defensor ecclesiae, or is it the religious ruler? I mean, look at it this way. I mean, this is a partnership that when it works, it works, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. And here's a perfect example. The civil ruler can say to the bishop of Rome, listen, <laughs> look at the last 300 years. You didn't do so well with my protection, did you? And now if you want to evangelize, you're going to do really, really well. And the bishop of Rome says, yeah, thanks. I not saying I don't appreciate any of that. But when you die, you're not going to be emperor. When you die, you're just going to be dead. And your soul is going to go to heaven. And I, as your spiritual leader, your soul is on my hands. I'm going to have to give an account for you. So on this earth, yeah, maybe you're in charge. <laughs> but in the next world, I'm in charge. Well, God's in charge. And I am the successor to Peter. And Peter holds the keys to the kingdom. So do the math. I'm the person. Do you see the tension there? There's a lot, and that's the story of the Middle Ages. That's the story of the investiture controversies of the Middle Ages. Charlemagne will claim to be the successor of Constantine. He has coins struck with Constantine's face on one side and his face on the other side. Charlemagne will call himself the 13th apostle, priest and king. Let's complicate this even more. Christian kings and other rulers are anointed. Do you remember in Hebrew scripture, Saul anoints David with oil? Is the coronation of a king or emperor a baptism, an anointing? Is it an ordination? Is it the eighth sacrament, as some thought? Charlemagne says, I am the defender of the faith and the defender of the church. In fact, he physically helps a particular pope by the name of Leo III. And in thanks for that, Leo III crowns Charlemagne on Christmas Day 800. You can't make this stuff up. Holy Roman Emperor. Before that, he's a king of the Franks. Now he is an emperor with the clothing hearkening back to Rome. And people will take the title Holy Roman Emperor way up through history. And we have an example of a flashpoint very quick. So things are happening quickly, huh? The Battle of the Milvian Bridge, 312. The Edict of Milan, 313. Fifty years later, Theodosius the Great 
making Christianity the official and the only religion. And just 10 years after that, Ambrose of Milan. Ambrose is a bishop in Milan. Milan is a very important city because if you're traveling south to north, you have Rome, you have Central Europe, and to get through those mountains, you need a stopping point, and that stopping point is Milan, a very important city even today. And at this point, the, the bishop of Milan is really more powerful than the bishop of Rome because it's the bishop of Milan named Ambrose who's going to uh, uh, wag his finger and berate the emperor. By the way, you may know Ambrose because Ambrose was a great preacher and Augustine of Hippo, who becomes the bishop of Hippo because he, before he's even Christian, goes from Carthage to Rome, and when he's in Rome, he hears about this great Ambrose, goes to Milan to study under him, to see what makes him so great. And Ambrose becomes a bit of a mentor to Augustine, and it plays a pretty important role in bringing Augustine to Christianity. Ambrose of Milan is a late Roman man. If Ambrose had lived 200 years before and wasn't a Christian, he would have been one of these provincial governors. He had the skill from those secondary skills of Hadrian uh, schools. He was a great rhetor. He knew how to organize. And in fact, what's happening is that now bright young boys may not go straight into imperial administration. Bright young boys have another choice. And that other choice is to go into the church, and some people will say later on, as we'll see in topic 12, that this drains, there's a brain drain of great skill not going into the imperial um, service, but going into church service are these young men. So Ambrose of Milan takes head on this question, who is in charge? And he says, the, the incident is that there had been a revolt in 390 in a city called Thessalonica and the Emperor Theodosius, yes, the same Theodosius, was furious. And so he says, hey gang, I'm going to throw a huge party. I'm going to throw a set of games. Everybody goes into the theater at Thessalonica. Everybody thinks this is great. Emperors, you know, can go in you know, because in the Colosseum everything was free, so this is another little Colosseum in Thessalonica. They lock the doors, they bar the doors, and Theodosius has ordered the murder of the people of, Theodosi of Thessalonica. Thousands are killed on the personal order of Theodosius. And Ambrose says, and you call yourself a Christian? You murdered these people in cold blood? Yes, there were some rebels, but you think all of those people were rebels? What about women and children? How dare you? And he lays down a letter to Theodosius in which he says, bishops should judge laymen. Laymen should not judge bishops. Let me repeat that. It's so important. Bishops should judge laymen. Laymen should not judge bishops. And he excommunicates Theodosius. He demands public penance. It's one thing to demand it. Guess what? He gets it. Theodosius realizes, I can't go on without the protection of this guy. And that phrase, Ambrose's doctrine, is going to resound throughout medieval history. And so will another one. A bishop of Rome at this point named Gelasius sends a letter to another emperor named Anastasius. This is called the Gelasian doctrine, and it's called the Two Swords Theories. He says, it's not like you and I are equal. It's not like God gave you the sword of politics and military power and God gave me the spiritual sword. Uh-uh. God gave me both swords and I delegate to you the military or political sword. That means I am your superior, you are my inferior. Shut up and get in line. And throughout the Middle Ages, later bishops and theologians and popes, when they are fighting emperors and kings, will always say, as Ambrose said to Theodosius, and as Theodosius obviously agreed, as Gelasius said to Anastasius, and then they build on this in canon law. This leads to something, here's a very old word, Caesaropapism, you'll find this in old books, that the papacy became like a Caesar, Romanized, and the pros, of course, of getting 
the protection of Caesar Augustus, whatever his name was, Constantine at this point, but he has the title Caesar Augustus, are protection and wealth to evangelize. But last time I checked, money and power corrupts. And what's happening is a shift because as the empire is collapsing and power is shifting to Constantinople because Constantine is going to go to Constantinople, the Bishop of Rome is now going to grow in power and prestige.